ever since its debut, the Mazda 3 has been known to be the more zesty alternative to the Toyota Corolla and Honda Civic. But does it truly live up to its reputation for fun and reliability? Today, I'm going to dive into how it drives and what it's actually like to maintain one of these second generation Mazda 3s. If you like what you see, please subscribe and hit the bell. That way you get more high quality content and I get closer to making this a full-time job. Thank you. Now back to the review. The second generation Mazda 3 came out for the 2010 model year. I have a 2013 model here. The first thing that I want to talk about is the paint. While it is not known for as many issues as old Honda paint, many owners report that it is prone to scratching and this particular one looks like it was washed with a street sweeper so just make sure to baby it. When it comes to trims, the Mazda 3 offers three main variants, iSport, iTouring, and iGrand Touring. For 2012, the Sky Active engine and transmission were released, and Mazda has sanctioned the old MZR 2.0-liter to only the new base trim, ISV. The 2.5 that was once available in the Sport was now designated to only the S Grand Touring, all because of Sky Active. But unlike my mom force-feeding banquet meatloaf to me as a kid, the Skyactiv powertrain improved the Mazda 3. But let's get back to the exterior. The headlights were halogens, fog lights, bi-xenon headlights, and LED taillights were standard on the S Grand Touring and came with the tech package on the I Grand Touring. Now this was also one of the first years of Mazda's Joker face on the front. Uh, which is kind of a love it or hate it design. Compared to Mazda's current design language and even what came out in 2014, this is drastically different. Which one do you guys prefer? Do you like the more happy, do you want to know how I got these scars look, or do you like the more serious and mature look of the newer Mazdas? Let me know in the comments section. On the Sport SV, you got a physical key to enter the car and start it. With the regular Sport, you got keyless entry. With the Touring, you got proximity key which is very nice and helpful it's just through a button and that also gave you push button start on the inside you could get an option for 17 inch wheels if you stepped up in trims to the grand touring if you go with the sv you will find 16 inch hubcaps the sport and touring will get 16 inch alloys you could also get a hatchback in touring and grand touring trims I think the five door looks athletic. While this is subjective, to me, the newer hatchbacks have adopted more of a slouch back look due to the absence of a third window. What do you guys prefer? When, when it comes to aesthetics, honestly, I don't think the side profile was a huge departure from the previous first generation Mazda 3, and I, I don't have any complaints about that. It had nice proportions, it still looks sporty, and you could get a hopped up Mazda Speed 3 that was only available in the hatchback form, and that came packing a 2.3 liter direct injected turbocharged engine, 263 horsepower, or almost 100 more than the 2.5 liter had. That, that model honestly is a completely different car, so I'm not going to talk much about it. Briefly, I'd like to thank Royal on the East Side for loaning me this Mazda 3. The staff is friendly and knowledgeable, and they pack some pretty cool new and used cars. If you're in the market, check them out. Around back, you will find a single exhaust pipe and a clear taillight design. If you get the Touring with the Smart Key Proximity Unlock feature, you can just walk up to the rear gate, there's a little button, you press it and it pops open. The exterior of the Mazda 3 keeps it fun with not too many frills. The interior uh, is the same minus some of the fun. You really start to appreciate the cars that have been coming out recently due to their upscale materials. Even the new Mazda 3 that I drove last time uh, just feels like it's in a completely different segment than this car. That's not to say that it's all bad. The seats are relatively comfortable. If you get the Grand Touring, you get eight-way power adjustable. Uh, this one, I mean, I'm just, it's six-way adjustable. Now, particular problems for these cars, one that I know personally is an actuator for the aircon system that basically will click for like 30 seconds and then stop. It's a pretty cheap repair. This particular three also has abnormal wear on the interior, 
probably due to the sun. A sunroof is available on the Touring through the preferred package. It's standard on the Grand Touring. The GT is also the only way to get leather. The interior fit is not quite up to the levels of Toyota in a few areas. Outside of the sun damage, the steering wheel does have a nice leather quality. Uh, this came on the Touring trim. The base model just had a plastic wheel. The gauge cluster is analog, as you'd probably expect. It's not super contrasty. I, I think there were some gauge clusters around this time that looked a little bit more crisp. I'm happy to say that Bluetooth audio is going to come on the iTouring and up. You're going to have six speakers if you choose the iSport and up, which I would definitely recommend. The four speakers, the, I haven't tested that one out, but I'm sure that the high range tweeters missing is going to have an effect on the experience. This being the touring trim had the availability of a 10 speaker Bose system. Now it's not super powerful, but it more than gets the job done. And the additional speakers does help. With that package, you're also going to get blind spot monitoring. Pretty helpful. And that came on even the 2010 models. Now, both of those features come standard if you hop up to the Grand Touring. Now, the Grand Touring will also add heated seats up front, but the Touring will at least still have dual zone automatic climate control. It seems like a lot of older Bluetooth audio and calling systems had a pretty unintuitive interface and everything was powered by voice. Entering the setup select phone menu. Please say the name of the device you would like to select. Available devices are Matthew's phone. Heidi's phone. Dan's phone. Beat Navy. <laughs> now with me in a comfortable position, I'm going to see how I fit in the back seat. Behind myself in the rear seat, I am definitely compromised on leg room. The nice thing is, is I can put my knees to the side of the seat and I can still shut the door. So this is reasonable. The seats are also well cushioned. However, my headroom is pretty limited. So I guess if I were in an accident, I'd probably want to, uh, tuck. One thing to note, the front seat has not very soft elbow rest points. It's particularly more tough on the center console, but the back seat has like cheap, really, really cheap, hard plastic where your elbows rest. You're not going to get vents back here. You're not going to get any USB ports or car outlets. It's a pretty basic experience all the way up to even the Grand Touring trim. The trunk of the 2013 Mazda 3 is, well, not too accommodating. It fits me, and you got a spare tire underneath. I don't think it's as spacious as what's found in the Toyota Corolla or Honda Civic of this year. However, it's still not disappointing to me. You can fold down the rear seats. Overall, the back seat and the trunk are not exactly pros to the Mazda 3. But one big pro is how it drives. To me, the Mazda 3 is not a four-door Mazda Miata. However, behind the wheel, you are quickly reminded of why Mazda earns the reputation that it does. To start things off, let's clear up the confusion with some of the engines. So, in 2010, this generation debuted. Originally, all you could get was a two-liter four-cylinder making 148 horsepower and 135 pound-feet of torque. This is dubbed the MZR engine. The bigger MZR engine was uh, the 2.5 liter. That made 167 horsepower and 168 pound-feet of torque. Both of those engines carried through 2010 to 2013. The car was eventually redesigned completely in 2014. The model I have features the Skyactiv G 2 liter engine that packs direct injection and a high 12 to 1 compression ratio. It ekes out 155 horses and 148 pound feet of twist on regular gas and provided mid 8 second 0 to 60 runs when new. But let's see what I can get after 96,000 miles in 7 years. It's raining, I wish it wasn't, so I'm not going to expect too great of a time here. The only benefit we have is, uh, 148 pound-feet of torque is not going to spin these wheels too much. All right, so we're going to brake torque. All right, this will be a good one. A lot of rain here. And 60. Not bad. 
Initially, the slightly more powerful 2.5 was available in the Sport and Grand Touring trims. For the 2012 model year, things changed. Then, the 2.5 liter became reserved only for the Grand Touring, or S Grand Touring buyers. But now, the bigger thing to note was the base 2 liter engine that had has been in service for, I mean, I think since the Mazda 3 originally came out back in 2003, um, that engine is now reserved only for the ISV trim. And this was because Mazda was introducing their Sky Active engines. Sky Active is Mazda's initiative to build a more efficient vehicle while still not sacrificing power. And this also came along with a new six-speed automatic and a new six-speed manual transmission that boasted the shortest shifter throw in the class. Now, I have driven the manual transmission. Now, I wouldn't say that it's a shockingly short throw, but it was enjoyable. I can't tell you more than that because I didn't really get too much time behind the wheel. It was just when I was a uh, lot porter. So I've at least dabbled with that car. The six-speed automatic that I have in here responds appropriately. Obviously, it's tuned for gas mileage, but I don't have too much of a problem with this because one, it certainly beats the hell out of most CVTs from this era and damn near most now. Of course, those differences really are only going to be seen whenever you're trying to hoon the thing. But sportiness aside, the Skyactiv technology is, was designed to get better gas mileage, and that's exactly what this thing did. Mazda touted 40 miles per gallon when this came out, but the EPA shows numbers just shy of that. The manual changed fuel mileage slightly. Overall, when you look at the regular 2 and 2.5 liter, the Skyactiv blows them out of the water. So why would you buy them? Well, all of these engines have proved to be more robust than a Nokia with a Kevlar jacket and a healthy balanced diet. If you do maintenance yourself, I can imagine that the old MZR engines would be easier to wrench on and probably have cheaper parts. Really, you can't go wrong with any of the power plants. Now, getting up to speed. Put my foot to the floor. It's not a very inspiring engine. It's uh, not the most refined in terms of sound or feel. Power is adequate, which for this segment is pretty much all you need. The base 2 liter is only available with a 5-speed auto or manual, which might make it a bit doggish compared to the 6-speed. I've driven a 2.5 liter with the 5-speed automatic and it never felt overwhelmed. It can also be had with a 6-speed manual. Oh yeah, and all Mazda 3s of this generation could be had with three pedals. While this is cliche and I still love new Mazdas, there's no denying that the brand was more dedicated to fun when this car was new than it is now. That is especially apparent in the handling department. Now I'm not saying that this is the most communicative steering rack. I'm not saying that this has the capability to hang with sports cars. I'm saying that the steering just feels the way that I want a small car to feel. What I mean by this is that the steering is precise, very precise. It makes the car feel extremely chuckable. There is no play on center. And you couple that with excellent suspension. You have independent rear suspension in here as well. That is on the stiff side for the segment, yes, but it makes the car playful. And the steering rack itself is still pretty light. A lot of cars, and I'm not going to shame them for this, instead of pumping in feedback uh, will choose to make their steering racks heavier. And that gives the illusion of feedback or a connection to the road. But the Mazda steering is authentic. Now, a lot of drivers of inexpensive small cars, especially used ones, are probably college kids or they're people just looking for a family car on a budget. They're probably not going to uh, be like, oh my God, the steering. Oh. Those people might still appreciate its nimble and easy to drive nature, but they will probably care more about comfort. And the second gen Mazda 3 does not disappoint there either. That stiff ride, it really does not make the vehicle feel harsh. It's still taut, composed. It does crash over larger imperfections, but it never felt too disrupted. The 3 handles with the confidence of a mid-size car. Road noise seems to be on par with the 8th gen Honda Civic, tolerable but far from class leading. So while this is far from the Lexus of the segment, I would still say that the Mazda 3 is more than road trip worthy. 
And I can say that with confidence because I've driven and been in one of these for several hours at a time and I've had no problem. Another thing that you won't have any problem with, most likely, is reliability. These are really freaking reliable. And you might be kind of surprised by that because everybody that feels like they have a sense of what cars are and which ones are good and bad, say Toyota and Honda, Toyota and Honda, and they forget about Mazda. And while Toyota, yes, they are probably the most consistently reliable brand, Mazda has been knocking it out of the park for a while now. And this generation of Mazda 3, really we saw an acceleration of this. Not only did they start to fix that rust problem that they used to always be known for, um, but really people aren't reporting much problems at all with the engines, with the transmissions. Yes, this platform and the MZR powertrains were mostly created as a joint project between Volvo, Mazda, and Ford, but everything has held up remarkably well. Consumer Reports cites noises and leaking problems as less than ideal, both of which I have never encountered with a second Gen 3. I could not find anything else really worth mentioning. Just include intake valve cleaning into your maintenance every 30,000 miles or so if you buy a Skyactiv 3, as direct injection won't clean off carbon deposits on them. This will help retain performance and efficiency over the long haul. Really the biggest shortcoming for me is probably just the interior feel. It definitely feels like a cheaper car and it, because it is, but the driving experience would definitely fool you into thinking that you have a more substantial vehicle. So the Mazda 3 is efficient, it's fun, it's reasonably comfortable, and very reliable. Overall, I'm really having a hard time thinking of reasons why if you're shopping for a small car, you might not want to pick up a Mazda 3. My one disclaimer to possible buyers, remember that this is still a budget compact car. Yes, it handles well, but it's not tuned for track use when stock. The engines sound like vacuums and lack the punch of, say, a Mazda Speed 3, Honda Civic Si, or Subaru WRX. The 2013 Mazda 3 is the overachieving kid in high school. They can manage straight A's and AP courses while also somehow performing at state-level athletics. They beat your ass in almost everything, to the point where you start to get jealous. And then you meet them, and you're like, wow, he is actually pretty fucking great. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like and consider subscribing. I'll catch you in the next one.